Originally, when Haney gave me the title, it was for everything that bleeds in trauma. But I figure, you know, what the heck? We're all friends now. Let's go over some medical things as well. So let's bring Sal up here and talk about blood. Blood. They've had enough of me today, I think. Yeah? <laughs> Uh, so we're going to talk about tranexamic acid for everything that bleeds. And originally when Haney gave me the title, it was for everything that bleeds in trauma. But I figure, you know, what the heck? We're all friends now. Let's go over some medical things as well. So I'm actually going to cover seven or eight different uses of tranexamic acid. So it's not all going to just be trauma. I promise that we're going to go through a lot of literature and data in a digestible way. I have a summary slide for you at the end, so don't stress about writing all the numbers down as we're going through. So let's start with trauma patients. So there's really more than these two trials, but these were probably the two big trials that got the most publicity. And these were MATTERS, which was published in 2012, and then uh, CRASH-2. And the MATTERS trial was observational 800 patients, CRASH-2 was randomized clinical trial 20,000 patients. So a very, very large study. And when you look at giving tranexamic acid to these patients, when we specifically just look at matters, we see that the number needed to treat is actually pretty good, 13 and 15, depending on which mortality range you look at. But also, if you look at the massive transfusion protocols required, they were also pretty impressive. The reason I want to bring this up is because if you go back and look at the CRASH-2 trial, the number needed to treat is actually not as impressive. And this is a problem with a lot of smaller trials is that you, you don't get this regression to the mean. You see these super awesome numbers and then people want to jump on that. And the reality is, is that tranexamic acid in trauma, it works, it helps. But it's probably not as impressive as number needed to treat of 13 and 15 like the MATTERS trial showed us. It's probably something in the range of 67 to 13. That's probably the more realistic number. So the bottom line in trauma is that if you get a trauma patient and they're less than or equal to three hours, and you're thinking, and or you're thinking massive transfusion protocol, the dosing based on the studies is one gram of tranexamic acid IV over 10 minutes, followed by another gram over um, the next eight hours. Intracranial hemorrhage. So there was one meta-analysis, which was basically two trials with 500 patients, and then there was TIC2, which was 2,300 patients. So it's certainly the bigger trial. And if you take all three of those trials and you kind of put them all together, there's really one consistent story here. There's no difference in mortality, there's no difference in neurofunction, and there's no difference in hematoma expansion at 48 hours. So really don't see any benefit. Now, there are two conclusions that actually did show benefit, but you have to understand that these are hypothesis generating. In other words, not ready for prime time yet. And that is that we saw hematoma expansion at 24 hours, and mortality at seven days, there was some signal of improvement, but not statistically significant, and why it's hypothesis generating. It may be that the studies are just too small. We don't have enough numbers. But the one thing I want to point out here is, is I don't recommend tranexamic acid right now for intracranial hemorrhage. And there is actually a study underway called CRASH-3. And I have been in contact with the lead authors of this paper, and they're actually getting ready to release their results, hopefully either by the end of this year or early next year. So they're done recruiting, and we're all just kind of chomping at the bit to see if this is something that's going to change practice or not. But they're specifically looking at tranexamic acid for intracranial hemorrhage, whether we should be giving it or not. But I think right now, best evidence says no benefit in giving it. Postpartum hemorrhage. So a woman trial, also a large randomized clinical trial, 20,000 women randomized to either tranexamic acid or no tranexamic acid. And the numbers looked pretty impressive-ish. So if you look at death due to postpartum hemorrhage, it was a number needed to treat of about 250. If you took the subset of people that were like our trauma patients, three hours or less, that number was closer to 200. But here's the big problem with this study. So you guys may not know what a fragility index is. Fragility index is basically how fragile are the results of a study. So the fragility index of 20,000 patients is zero. In other words, if one more patient would have had a positive or negative outcome, the results of this study would be not statistically significant. So although the number is number needed to treat of 200 and 250, 
kind of shaky ground that we're standing on despite 20,000 patients. I still have several of my OBs that uh, want to give this medication, and I don't argue. Pick your battles. If they want me to give a gram of tranexemic acid, I'll give a gram of tranexemic acid. I'm not going to argue. I'll tell you in my practice, though, I'm using it in the sickest patients. So the ones that are hemodynamically unstable or I'm transfusing them blood actively, what do you have to lose? It's not an expensive medication. It's cheap. It's easy to give. And so I'll try it in that scenario. But I'll still have OB sometimes asking me to give it. And I just say, pick your battles. Uh, I don't think the evidence shows harm, but it doesn't really show us much benefit either. I think it's very weak ground. This is a diagnosis that I think a lot of us have been waiting for, for tranexemic acid and GI bleed. And it's kind of frustrating because depending on who you ask, they'll say give it or don't give it. And the reason is, is because the evidence isn't that robust. So Cochrane had a meta-analysis published in 2014, and it was eight trials with 1,700 patients. So these are all really small trials, and we've already talked about the problem with really small trials. If you put all those trials together, what they ended up showing is a mortality benefit number needed to treat of 29. The issue is, is that there was lots of methodologic issues with each of the individual smaller papers, and so it, you have to look at the little parts and not just the summary. So although the summary looks really good, the individual trials weren't that great. So this is not a really robust, although the number looks good, based on the methodology of the studies, not super good. Now, the one thing I will say is they had a secondary outcome of re-bleeding, and there was a trend toward decreased re-bleeding in GI bleed, but not statistically significant. And that's kind of where I see this being a useful medication. So it reduces mortality, but weak evidence. Maybe it reduces re-bleeding. I'm only using this in my sickest patients again. So if I have somebody who's hemodynamically unstable, I'm transfusing them blood actively, they have bright red blood pouring out, what do you have to lose? Might as well just give it and see what happens. But what I'm gonna tell you is that the evidence for this is, it's weak, we, we don't know. The other thing that's super frustrating is depending on those eight trials that you look at, some of them gave like a gram PO every four hours. Some of them were giving 12 grams over a 24 hour period. The dosing is all over the place. So I don't even know what dose to tell you to give based on the studies that have been done. Now, much like the intracranial hemorrhage, there is currently a trial called the HALT-IT trial, randomized clinical trial that's under, being done in the UK. 14,000 patients with upper GI bleed, and they're looking at TXA versus no TXA. And again, much like the uh, CRASH-3 trial, we should hopefully have results by the end of this year or beginning of next year. Until then, I don't know what to tell you, but I'm giving one gram in my sickest patients because what do you have to lose? Epistaxis. I love using TXA and epistax. This has been like a game changer for me. I don't need this study to tell me. I see it every day when I have people coming in on their DOAX or on their Coumadin or on their aspirin and their Plavix and they come in with a nosebleed. This has been a game changer. But this is a randomized clinical trial, 124 patients on aspirin and or Plavix. And they basically took a piece of gauze, like a little pledget, and they put 500 milligrams of tranexemic acid and they put that into the anterior nair and put a little clamp on it. And what they ended up finding is that the number needed to treat was two. A 10 minute cessation of epistaxis. Pretty impressive number, not a large paper, but I gotta tell you that this is probably what I'm seeing in my practice as well anecdotally. And I, the, I can't remember the last time I had to put one of those little rhino rockets in somebody's nose or one of those balloon tamponade devices into somebody's nose. This has actually been like my go-to. I'll spray some Afrin in there, try and remove whatever clot or blood I can, and then I'll soak the gauze, I'll put it in there with a little clamp, and I pretty much not have to do anything else for these patients. So 500 milligrams, you can do 1,000 milligrams if you want. I don't think anybody really knows what the optimal dose is. You wanna already opened up the vial, go ahead and put the full 1,000 in there. What I find is, is that if it's not topically touching the nair where the bleeding is coming from, you're basically just putting extra medication for nothing. So what I like to do is put 500 and keep 500 in case I need to switch out the pledget and put a second one in. So I do 500 and 500 if that makes sense. Post-tonsillectomy bleeding. 
So there was a great meta-analysis done in 2012, and I hate to burst y'all's bubble on this. It was all uh, preoperative, and it was all prophylactic. So these patients all got prophylactic tranexemic acid versus no tranexemic acid, and then they went to the OR and had surgery. So that doesn't help me in the ER, right? So there was one case report that I found really interesting, and by no means am I saying we should change practice based off of one case report, but I gotta tell you that I have done this a few times, and it's pretty cool. It's uh, like doing a modified Valsalva maneuver with SVT. You pretty much like mic drop and walk out of the room. Um, but what I'm doing is I'm nebulizing my tranexemic acid. So I'll take 500 milligrams, put it into a nebulizer, put the nebulizing mask on them, and then I'll have them just inhale. And I've done this maybe about 10 or 12 times, and I've yet to have to call ENT in in the 10 or 12 times that I've done this. Um, it usually stops the bleeding. Now, if you have somebody who's like got an arterial pumper, this is not what we're talking about, right? We're talking about somebody who's got that venous dribble that's coming down the back of their neck that's super annoying to them. The person with the pumper is gonna need like their airway taken, they're gonna need direct pressure, they're gonna need all kinds of things done. So definitely wanna make sure that I, I have that caveat as we talk about this. This is not everybody who comes in with a post tonsillectomy bleed. And then the last is hemoptysis. So this is kind of controversial, and I almost guarantee if you ask the intensivists uh, versus the ER docs, we may have two different opinions, but I don't think we're that different. So there was one case series of 14 patients and one randomized clinical trial of almost 50 patients published in the same year, looking at nebulized tranexemic acid for hemoptysis. And in the case series, at least, they showed resolution by 30 minutes in about 50%, okay? And if you look at the uh, randomized clinical trial, it was a number needed to treat of two, which looks really impressive, except that their primary outcome was five days. That does nothing for me down in the ER. I don't care if they stop bleeding five days from now. I want them to stop bleeding now, right? So what the intensivist will tell you is that, look, if you have somebody coming in with bad hemoptysis, you need to take that airway and you need to get to definitive therapy, which is bronchoscopy, right? And that's great for the intensivist, except that I don't do bronchoscopy and I work out in the community in a standalone shop where I'm not attached to anything other than just the ER I'm in. And all I can do, not like I can put a finger on it and stop the bleeding, I'll do anything to try and slow the bleeding down or stop it until they can get to definitive therapy. And so this is something I've implemented, but I gotta say it's kind of, I probably agree with about the 50% success rate. But I'm actively picking up the phone and calling my intensivist saying that this person probably needs bronchoscopy. Another option would even be interventional radiology. They can embolize something if they, they actually can see the bleeder. And so this should not get in the way of definitive therapy. If, you have, if you're at a shop where you can get bronchoscopy done right away or you can get them to interventional radiology, take their airway and get them to definitive therapy. Don't start doing this hoping that this is gonna slow it down. All right, so this is a very particular patient. So I've been asked like how you do this and you basically just take the vial and you pour like the, the full vial in there, it should fit no problem. Some people like to put like five cc's of normal saline with that. I find that that doesn't really benefit very much. I just pour it in there and just start nebulizing it and I find that it works pretty well. You don't have to actually do that. Some of the RTs like to put uh, a little bit of saline in there with it. I find that the little tub that you have to pour this stuff into though can only take so many cc's. And so after a while, it's all kind of flowing over the top. So just the vial itself is more than enough. So here we go, this is a summary, right? So intracranial hemorrhage is probably the only one that I'm gonna tell you no, right now we don't have the evidence to support. I think postpartum hemorrhage and GI bleed, there is some evidence that shows benefit, but it's very weak evidence. And in my practice, I'm using this on the sickest patients, not on all patients. And then in all the other scenarios, I think there is benefit. With the caveat of hemoptysis, you have to be very, very careful and be selective about the patient and make sure you get to definitive therapy first before you let this get in the way. And just like every talk I always do, I already have a blog post with all the references, with all the papers broken down. Take a picture of the QR code and it will take you right there and break it all down for you. Thank you very much.